for today's webinar, 30, A Look from the Inside, with nuclear researcher Lucas Hickson. I am Tim Judson, the Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, which is hosting the presentation. We are pleased that so many of you could be here today. This year, NEARS has kicked off a new project to highlight the environmental cost of nuclear power, called Nuclear is Dirty. Through this project, we are highlighting the environmental, social justice, and public health impacts of nuclear power, from uranium mining through to the production and management of radioactive waste generated by nuclear power plants and, of course, nuclear power plant accidents. NEARS has undertaken the Nuclear is Dirty project to inform debates happening around the country about what our best energy options are for reducing carbon emissions and responding to climate change, and in recognition of the anniversaries of the ongoing nuclear disasters at Chernobyl, Fukushima, Church Rock, New Mexico, and other communities. Disturbingly, industry-friendly policymakers are promoting measures that would categorize nuclear power as a clean or, or even renewable energy resource and in many cases giving it preference over solar, wind, geothermal, energy efficiency, and other renewable energy sources. <clears throat> the environmental and human costs of our energy choices are what matter the most. And by that measure, nuclear also fails. The consequences of using uranium to power our communities are real and extensive. The Nuclear is Dirty project will provide accurate information and firsthand accounts of the environmental and social impacts of nuclear energy. And we ask that you pay it forward and share the information with your friends. Not to worry, almost all of the events will be recorded, so you can also share them by email, Facebook, and Twitter. Over the last two months, we have already covered a wide range of issues, beginning with the front end of the nuclear fuel chain. We heard from First Nations communities about the lasting impacts of the 1979 Church Rock uranium mill tailings disaster, as well as the problem of abandoned uranium mines plaguing communities throughout the western U.S. We also hosted a presentation by nuclear safety expert Arnie Gunderson and Nears' Mary Olson on their meetings with refugees and survivors of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster and their, visit to, their visits to communities directly affected by it. And most recently, we hosted a presentation on the abusive use of water resources and wildlife by nuclear reactors cooling systems, which consume vast amounts of water. Today, we turn again to the impacts of a nuclear reactor disaster. Last week commemorated the 30th anniversary of the 1986 explosion and fire at the, at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine. In recent years, news coverage of Chernobyl in the U.S. has focused on widely ranging estimates of the number of people who died as a result of the disaster. The nuclear industry and its promoters um, have promoted a story as divorced from reality and as methodologically flawed as the climate denial research promoted by the fossil fuel industry. Chernobyl is not a numbers game. It affected and continues to affect real people and actual communities. An area about the size of Rhode Island is still uninhabitable because it is too radioactively contaminated and will remain so for thousands of years. And the disaster is far from over yet, as you will hear today from Lucas Hickson, who has recently been there to conduct research and plans to return later this year. Lucas is a, is a Chicago-based researcher on nuclear technology, radiation, and environmental contamination. He published his studies on civilian and nuclear military, um, mil civilian and military nuclear facilities across the U.S. He is the managing editor of Informable Nuclear News, one of the top nuclear industry news services, as well as a board member of Beyond Nuclear. In recent years, he has been part of a research team investigating the burning Westlake landfill near St. Louis, Missouri, <clears throat> which brought to light dangerous levels of radioactivity from the burial of nuclear weapons waste. Last year, he spent 10 days at Chernobyl as part of an international team of researchers and nuclear industry professionals that were granted access to the site. We are pleased to have him with us here today. His presentation will take us from the moment Reactor 4 failed on, that, on April 26, 1986, its aftermath, and the ongoing mitigation work, up to his own recent experiences living with today's workers at the site of one of the largest man-made radioactive releases on the planet. That's Chernobyl today. In a moment, we will move on to Lucas's presentation, but first I have a few instructions on how we will handle questions and answers. Because of the large number of participants today, everyone has been muted. And at the end of the presentation, we will have 30 to 45 minutes for Q&A. To ask a question, you have two options using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. To ask your question verbally, press the yellow hand icon on the right-hand side of your screen, and when it comes your turn, you will be prompted that your line is unmuted. To submit a written question, type it into the question panel and submit it and we will intersperse verbal questions. We are sure that there will be plenty of questions and we want to make sure we cover as much information as possible. So to that end, we ask that everyone make their questions as, as concise as possible and refrain from making long statements. We also ask that you support the Nuclear Dirty campaign with a contribution. 
The purpose of this project is to spread the word and raise awareness of these issues as policymakers throughout the country are making vital decisions about our energy future. All contributions in support of the Nuclear is Dirty project will be matched dollar for dollar, and you can make a contribution through our crowdfunding campaign site at nuclearisdirty.nirs.org. So with that, let's begin. I'll hand it over to Lucas. Thanks, Lucas, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Tim. I guess, you know, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking NEARS, uh, specifically Tim Judson, Diane DeRigo, Mary Olson, and Michael Marriott for uh, hosting these presentations and giving us an opportunity to share this information with members of the public. I feel like that's a very, very important part of the work that I do. Uh, as as uh, it was mentioned, I'm a nuclear researcher based out of Chicago. Uh, I think that probably more accurate term would be a field technician. Uh, my work carries me to various contaminated sites across the U.S. and around the world where we conduct environmental uh, testing and monitoring of how radioactive materials move over time. Today, I want to talk to you about the accident at Chernobyl. We'll discuss the construction of the sarcophagus, the lives and activities of the workers who are currently working on projects at the site, like the new interim spent fuel storage repository, and as well as the new confinement structure. And we will also touch on some of the impacts on the exclusion zone and what the future will hold for Chernobyl, which is an important message not only for people in Japan, but also for us here in the United States. I'd like to start by discussing the geography and a little bit about the history of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. As you can see on your screens, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is located right next to its large cooling pond, which is man-made. Uh, and the city of Pripyat, which used to be where the workers would live, uh, was very close by. Uh, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is about 80 to 90 miles away from Kiev, which is about a quarter of the distance from Chicago to Detroit and roughly a quarter of the distance from Washington, D.C. to Virginia Beach. So they're in very close proximity. After the accident, uh, they had to select a new site for a town to be built for the workers as well as the people who are involved in the rectification activities as far as cleaning up the materials around the local site. The site that they picked was called Slavutic, which you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And there is now a train line that connects that town to the nuclear power plant called the Simicote train line. And that is the uh, train that you would take every day to and from the uh, nuclear power plant. And we will touch on that later. We're going to go through a little bit of the timeline of events at Chernobyl. It was about 1967 when the site was selected. The Unit 1 reactor went on in 1978. You'll notice that there's a cluster of activity between 1978 and about 1996. Uh, it's important to know that the Unit 4 reactor is not the only reactor on site that has been shut down due to a severe accident or meltdown. The Unit 2 reactor which operated for only 12 years, has been offline since a fire in 1991 in the turbine building that damaged critical safety equipment. There was also a partial core meltdown of the Unit 1 reactor in 1982, only four years into its operating lifespan. The Unit 3 reactor at Chernobyl was the operating reactor and was shut down in 2000, which signaled the end of the period of power production at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. What we'll be looking at here is a satellite image of the main portion of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And you will see you have units 1, 2, 3, and 4. There are four reactor buildings, and they are connected by a long, single turbine building, which is on the, underneath them. Uh, you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen the new confinement structure, which is under construction and looking to be moved in place in the next two years. However, there were also two other reactors, Units 5 and 6, in the right-hand corner of the screen, which were under construction at the time of the accident, but were never completed due to the contamination of those structures from the radioactivity released from the reactor. We're going to touch very briefly on some basic principles of reactor design and reactor physics, just so that we can have a better understanding of the sequence of events that led up to the accident in 1986. A nuclear reactor is a prime example of a chain reacting system. And while 
the individual may not be as familiar with a nuclear chain reaction. We are familiar with other reacting systems. Uh, a fire is a good example. Feedback, stability, and control concepts in nuclear reactors can easily be compared to the behaviors of fires. When operating a reactor or managing a fire, you have some of the basic principles. You have your fuel, you have your reactivity, you have the feedback, and you have methods of controlling these fires. Uh, with, with a combustible fire, your fuel is a combustible material that reacts with air when exposed to heat, producing more heat, which can cause additional combustion. Uh, in a reactor, the fuel is atomic nuclei that explode when they absorb slow-moving neutrons, producing more neutrons. Uh, generally, the neutrons that are released from the fission process are fast-moving neutrons, and they are slowed by the moderator, which is generally going to be water or graphite in this particular design. But you also want to pay attention to other components, such as reactivity. Uh, in a fire, reactivity de depends on the ability of the heat to transfer as well as heat leakage and the availability of size, fuel, and air. I think we all have had personal experiences with building fires where maybe we stacked our fuel too closely together or we used damp fuel and it affected our ability to operate the fire. And this is also true for reactors. On that warm spring night in 1986, operators in the Unit 4 control room were running an experiment. During the experiment, operators had trouble maintaining the power levels, and the reactor power dipped below 30 megawatts and fell into what we call the iodine pit. This is a poisoning process, which is almost like uh, in a fire when the ashes build up and stifle the heat transfer uh, of the flames. The short-lived daughter products build up, absorbing neutrons and suppressing the ability to resume the intended power levels. The reactor was now entering dangerous waters and becoming ever more difficult to control. If the operators failed to complete the test that evening, they might not have been able to repeat it for nearly a year. So there was significant pressure to conduct the test no matter what was going on. Three of the operators in the control room attempted to manually operate the reactor by adjusting the steam pressure and water level but they were unable to keep the water and the fuel channels from boiling and steam from being generated. This changed the internal dynamics of the reactor and caused a surge of power. When the operators noticed the power levels increasing, they pressed the emergency reduction power system, which is also termed as the AZ or AZ button. This button was designed to drop the control rods into the reactor and stop the nuclear chain reaction. No one in the control room that night would have guessed in their wild dreams what sequence of events would be set into motion by that action. After the button was pressed and the control rods began to insert, the reactivity in the reactor accelerated out of control, leading to a prompt neutron power surge that was beyond control and completely destroyed the reactor. The control rods which helped the operators control the nuclear reaction in the reactor were graphite tipped. When the AZ button was pressed, the steam building up in the reactor caused a rise in reactivity, and when the rods began to insert, they displaced some of the water in the core, but did nothing to slow down the chain reaction. The control rods began to drop, but almost immediately stopped. They never fully inserted, partly because of the forces inside of the reactor as well as the destruction of the fuel channels. Therefore, once inserted, they only displaced some of the water in the reactor and did nothing to stem the increase of reactivity. Once the operators realized that they could not get the control rods to insert, they also realized that they had completely lost control of all ability to stop the chain reaction in the core. After they realized that the control rods would not insert, they began attempting alternative methods of trying to insert them, which would bring the reactor back under control, but their efforts were ultimately unsuccessful. These, some of these operators, like many other emergency responders, would later die from the exposures they received that night without ever really understanding what had happened. This is a uh, image inside of the Unit 4 control room, and uh, the hand that's hovering is actually hovering over the AZ button. Uh, 
when the tips of the control rods displace the coolant water, when you combine that with the other things that were happening inside of the reactor, like the rise of temperature and the fact that they had pulled out some of the safety rods, which would slow the multiplication of neutrons in, rea in the reactor, the reaction ran out of control. It led to a positive power uh, reactivity feedback. There are a few popularly recognized contributing factors to the accident. As we've mentioned, the operators took the steps that they thought would lead to the control of the chain reaction in the, in the, uh, uh, in the reactor. A good analogy is that the reactor was like a car traveling down the road at 60 miles an hour approaching a stop sign. But as soon as the operators hit the brake or the AZ button, the car begins to accelerate instead of slowing down and speeds up until it blows up. The operators had done what they were instructed to do. They had tried to be, bring the chain reaction under control, but their actions unwittingly led to disaster. And there are four uh, basic contributing factors that I'd like to talk about just briefly. One was the operator re, uh, contrib, uh, factors. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant staff performed some actions which were contrary to regulatory and technical instructions. And this led, this did contribute to the accident. Six of the staff were convicted of misconduct in trials during 1987, but we have since begun to focus less on the operator factors and more on some of the oper uh, factors related to design, safety, and overall risk. One of the big things to take away from the Chernobyl disaster is safety culture. This is a term that was coined in response uh, by NSAG, but it encompasses the faults specific to Chernobyl and the wider system of nuclear power regulation and management in the Soviet Union. And the pressures that were put on the operators at the time. And this is a term that has since become very, very popular around the world, especially in the United States, but it is very, very difficult to define what it ac actually means. The explosion that night destroyed the Unit 4 reactor building. It ripped through the protection barriers and overcame all of the safety systems. It also damaged portions of the turbine building and left fires scattered across the site, some of which burned for 10 days. The following is a quote from Gian Petrov, who at the time was an equipment manager for one of the regional companies that supplied equipment to nuclear power plants. That night, he was driving to Pripyat with his son about 2.30 in the morning a little more than an hour after the explosions. While approaching the, sit the city, Petrov could see the fires above the Unit 4 reactor, and he recorded what he saw. The ventilation stack, with its horizontal red and white stripes, was clearly lit up by the flames. I remember how the flames were higher than the shaft, so that meant they must have been nearly 600 feet in the air. Instead of turning to go home, I decided to go closer to the number 4 unit to get a better look. By the light of the fire, I could see that the building was half destroyed. It was a terrible sight. I stood there for about a minute, feeling a strangely oppressive sense of alarm, of numbness. Everything I saw was clearly imprinted on my memory for the rest of my life. I could see the flames on the roofs of the turbine hall and the deaerator, and I could see the firefighters. One of the firefighters had climbed onto the roof of the block. Now, some time later, I realized that he was the first person in the history of mankind to be exposed to that kind of dangers. Even in Hiroshima, there was no one who got that close to the nuclear explosion as the bomb went off at an altitude of 2,300 feet. But there, at Chernobyl, he was right next to the explosion. At his feet, a nuclear volcano emitting 30,000 Rankin an hour. To put that number into context, before the disaster, it would have been unheard of for the average nuclear industry worker to be exposed to more than five rankin a year during normal operation, and only 10 to 15 rankin per year for those that worked in high radiation areas. The image that we're looking on our screen is Elena. This is the biological shield at the top of the reactor. And underneath, you can see the fuel channels. Uh, and this lid has been moved by the explosion. Um, and it is still in this position. It's a fairly precarious position with only two points of contact. And there have been concerns about its long-term stability. Uh, if it were to 
fall, it would cause a large dust and, radio and release of radioactive materials. Uh, and that is one of the concerns that is driving them to put this new confinement structure over the reactor building and sarcophagus. The radiation released was in the form of radioactive gases, condensed particles, and particles of nuclear fuel and graphite. The intense heat of the core surged to over 2,500 degrees Celsius and worked like a chimney to push the radioactive plume thousands of feet into the atmosphere, where it traveled from the point of dispersion and spread until it was easily detected throughout the northern hemisphere, leaving behind a trail of contamination in virtually every country in both Eastern and Western Europe, and made substantial depositions as far away as the United Kingdom. Because the release took place over a period of time, it was greatly affected by the weather conditions. This resulted in widespread contamination in many different directions, with heavy deposits occurring in rainfall. But the mixture of radionuclides that made their way to the ground were not the same everywhere. After the accident, the Soviet government decided within a few weeks that they had to construct a, a sarcophagus of, of sorts to prevent the release of particles and gases as much as possible. Uh, they went through 18 different designs, and they ultimately chose the design that relied the most on the existing reactor building for stability and structural uh, control. And we'll talk about that later, because that did lead to some complicating factors that they're having to deal with now. When they started the construction of the sarcophagus, the first thing that they did is they used bulldozers and other large equipment to push uh, piles of debris and material back into the reactor building, uh, back towards it, and then they began constructing cascade walls, which you can see uh, in this picture, these steel walls. And they started from the, the bottom and began working their way up. This was a very difficult task, and many of the operations were carried out by remote control cranes. Uh, but this shows how precarious some of these operations are. You can see the crane on the left is actually half hanging off of one of these cascade walls as they are attempting to construct their way up to the top of the sarcophagus. Not all of the components could be constructed or built on site, so some of them, including these portions of the western wall, were assembled off site and then shipped in where they were lined up. This is the western wall of the Unit 4 reactor that you look at here. And they used uh, large cranes to push these pieces into place and the western wall is one of the stabilizing walls. So it was very important for them to use a different type of methodology than on the northern wall where we saw earlier with the cascade walls that they uh, built, which would not be stru uh, structurally sound enough to support the weight of this structure. Uh, what we're looking at here is the construction of the roof of the sarcophagus. They used these one meter in diameter steel pipes uh, to support some of the roof of this. And they had thought about filling these pipes with concrete to help uh, lower the doses, but they could not handle the additional weight that this would have provided at the top of the uh, structure, so they were left empty. Uh, they were lined up. They were lined up across this right here, this, and uh, you can see the top of the reactor underneath it. Next one. And you can see they were lined up going from north to south. And then over this, they began to place the skin of the sarcophagus, or the exterior steel panels. The sarcophagus is a 300,000-ton, 28-story shelter object. It's constructed largely out of lead, steel, and concrete, all of which is now extremely contaminated. It's important to remember that it has always been a temporary stopgap measure, not a permanent solution. In fact, there are many places where they didn't even connect different components of the structure because of the hazardous conditions, but also because they knew that they were installing these components just to take it apart again in the future. In 1988, Soviet scientists announced that the reactor, the sarcophagus, would only last 20 to 30 years before requiring extensive restorative and maintenance work. The designers had to deal with many different complexities like determining what parts of the reactor building could still support a load and which parts couldn't. They also had to plan for snow and wind loads and making sure that the structure would be somewhat earthquake resistant. The radiation levels in the area and the contamination of equipment only made everything more difficult. 
But even with all of these difficulties, the, sar the sarcophagus was completed within five months, which is an incredible engineering feat. Design of the sarcophagus started on May 20th, and the construction lasted for 206 days. But it is not a perfect structure. There are holes and gaps, and birds can even be seen flying in and out of the sarcophagus. In 1992, scientists from the Radium Institute and the Kirchhoff Institute began analyzing sources on the walls of the reactor in areas where they could access and began analyzing the dose rates. They estimated that up to one ton of nuclear fuel is covering the inner walls of the reactor building. Currently, only 60 to 70 percent of the sarcophagus has been explored. High radiation levels in the thousands of Rankin per hour prevent them from accessing other areas. We're looking at here the uh, operating floor of the Unit 3 reactor. The reactor here is in the forefront. You see the yellow refueling machine in the back. Uh, in the back walls, there's to be the spent fuel pool, and then they would have fresh fuel, unused fuel, hanging from the walls. The RBMK reactor design differs largely uh, from U.S. reactor designs in that they could refuel the reactor while operating. And on average, they would refuel about three to five assemblies per day. So they would constantly be swapping out uh, old assemblies for new assemblies and trying to manage the physics in the reactor. This is the inside of the Unit 4 operating floor as, as it was viewed inside of the sarcophagus. And you can see the amount of damage that's taken place. But I think there's one critical fact that escapes most people, which is how far off of the ground the reactor actually is. It's not a matter of just getting your water or other materials to the edge of this crater and dumping them in. The bottom of the reactor is about eight industrial floors off of the ground. So it, it is quite a difficult feat after a severe accident if you have to try and control these reactors without using your primary methods to try and get these materials in. And that's something that we saw in Japan as well. So today, the sarcophagus has reached its 30-year uh, estimate given by the scientists back in 1988. They've done extensive maintenance work on the roof. There was a portion of the turbine building, uh, turbine building which collapsed in 2013. But they are now building the new confinement structure, which will be moved in place over the sarcophagus, which will be designed to help prevent severe changes in the atmosphere inside of the building, as well as to prevent water uh, from getting in. If water were to get in and come into contact with some of the fuel materials, it can lead to additional reactivity uh, and, and the further release of radiation. The new confinement structure has been called the largest movable structure in the history of mankind. It's, it's large enough that you could fit the Statue of Liberty underneath it, and it will be moved in place over the sarcophagus in one day. Uh, the engineers that are in charge of this project communicated to us that the difficulty would not be in getting the, the new confinement structure to move as much as it would be getting it to stop where they wanted it to stop. Uh, this is a picture of the Unit 4 sarcophagus and the turbine building with the areas marked in red, which will be covered by the new confinement structure. Uh, the confinement structure has these panels, which you see, which will be operated when they move it in place, will be lifted up or lifted out to allow the new structure to move over the existing sarcophagus. And then once on the other side, they will be lowered back in place to protect the eastern portion of the building. It's an enormous structure. We had the opportunity to spend about two hours uh, touring the construction site. We were able to go underneath. Uh, and you see that the large cranes can fit easily underneath this. Uh, in the Yellow right here, you see one of the garrets that's going to be installed in the roof of this, which will later on be used to help disassemble some portions of the sarcophagus and maybe allow them to investigate some of the fuel materials inside of the reactor building. Uh, this is just a picture of the hydraulic systems, which will be used to move the confinement structure in place. But let's talk about the radiological conditions at Chernobyl. In 1986, a study produced by scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California found that the Chernobyl nuclear disaster released as much long-term radiation into the environment as all of the nuclear tests and weapons that had ever been detonated. 
Uh, what we're looking at here is a portion of melted fuel in the, the basement of the reactor building. This is called the elephant's foot. And there is lots of different types of melted fuel in the reactor. This is probably the most popular one. But what they are doing is they are causing a gamma field around the reactor. So this is one of the first things that we're going to talk about are the gamma fields. Uh, this is a picture of the gamma fields which are around the sarcophagus on the right. And on the left hand side you can see where the construction pad area is for the new confinement structure. The melted nuclear fuel is causing a field of increased radiation around the uh, reactor which can be detected in all directions and it really is a matter of time, distance, and shielding. It's an unavoidable dose, so you have to pick where you stand. You have to pick what's between you and the sarcophagus. Uh, and I have some good illustrations of that. One is this, this room right here. This is uh, one of the administrational buildings. It is maybe 250 to 300 yards away from the uh, sarcophagus. At my back, I'm taking this picture into the room, at my back is a window. Out that window you have a clear line of sight to the sarcophagus. When I was standing at the window looking at the sarcophagus and my dosimeter, which was on my waist, was facing towards the sarcophagus, I was picking up about 730 micro rankin an hour. The normal background on my device is typically between 5 to 6 micro rankin an hour. When I turned around and had my back to the window so that my body was acting as a meat shield between myself and the gamma fields, the radiation levels dropped down to about 270 micro rank in an hour. And when I walked to the other side of the room away from the window towards the poster that you see in the back, I was able to get that level to drop down even further to about 30 micro rank in an hour. So that's a good example of the time, distance, and shielding just by uh, using my body or by walking to the other side of the room away from the, the field, putting more material between my, uh, myself and the melted fuel, I was able to lower that dose rate. But there's also internal contamination that is something that has to be dealt with. I'd like to draw your attention to the ventilation building, which is between the Unit 3 and Unit 4 reactor buildings. The Unit 3 and Unit 4 reactor buildings are essentially mirror images of each other and they're connected by this ventilation building. Um, in the middle of the screen you can see the control rooms and then you see the turbine hall uh, where all of the turbines were lined up for the four operating units. We got a, a wonderful chance to explore some of the areas in the ventilation building and I would like to explain some of the contamination that we saw. This is what the hallways inside of the sarcophagus look like right now. They're very dimly lit. Uh, you can notice that they have plastic covering the floor to prevent the spread of loose contamination and those are uh, either covered up with more plastic or sometimes they'll pull them out and install new plastic in there. Uh, but there is lots of residual contamination all over the different equipment and the pipes. Uh, this is a picture of one of the pipes in the ventilation building that was uh, giving off some gamma levels. But some of them were also alpha emitters. Uh, right here we're using a pancake detector and we've actually maxed out its ability to detect uh, with the alpha contamination on top. Uh, likely uranium and plutonium uh, was our best guess. But the dust inside of the structure also collects uh, and accumulates in its radioactivity. So we were able to find many places where you see here where we're analyzing the dust on top of these pipes and the dust itself is extremely contaminated as well. Uh, this is a picture inside of the Unit 4 control room and there is more contamination on the operating panels. These workers were running in and out. Uh, there were no clean zones for them after the accident so there was a mass exodus and migration of radioactive materials through the interiors of these buildings. Uh, one of the hottest spots that we found inside the Unit 4 control room was up here in the corner uh, it's about 60 millirankin an hour, which is a pretty significant dose. So you have about 3,500 workers every day at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And depending on where they work, they take different methods to try and reduce the worker exposures. This is the industrial zone at the plant, or the construction site. 
On the right, you see the corner of the turbine building. The sarcophagus is kind of uh, hidden behind that. Uh, if you were to look to the left, just off screen, you would see the new confinement structure. But you can see uh, the site is probably best described as an active construction site. And uh, there are piles of material. The workers move through here. And so they do a couple things to address the spread of loose contamination. Number one, in the areas where workers change, they have employed the clean line principle. So you see this red line painted on the floor. Uh, you see how their boots are on one side of the line. This is where, when you're coming in and out of a structure where you're getting ready to change out of the clothes that you were wearing in the high contaminated areas, you take all of your shoes and externals off here and carry them with you. That way you're not tracking it through the rest of the building. And this is a very minimal uh, method of reducing, but it is, it is effective in terms of not spreading it in the interior of other buildings. But when you're walking around through the construction zone, you'll see these pans of water like you see here, and they'll be in front of the, the entrances to buildings or in the active construction zone. They're about every 30 to 50 feet. And you step into these and get your boots wet, and it removes the, fixed con uh, the loose contamination on your shoes and helps prevent the buildup of materials as you walk throughout the site. This is a picture uh, exiting the sarcophagus on our way out of the Unit 4 control room. And I want to call your attention to these three lead walls which have been constructed on the right here. Uh, the, these are something that they use for the supervisors or people who might have to spend a little bit of time in this construction zone. So that way you don't have to just, I guess you'd call it, eat the dose. Uh, what we found is that the uh, levels just behind the shields were about 50% of the levels on the other side. But that obviously went down the farther away you moved from those lead shields. But if you had to spend some time, that is a good way to reduce a portion of the uh, dose that you would be exposed to. This is the eastern, I'm sorry, this is the southern side of the turbine building where the roof collapse happened in 2013. In the middle of the screen, you can see two more of those lead walls that have been constructed. But on the left, you can see these four concrete viewing boxes. And uh, this is for workers uh, or supervisors to monitor activities where they might be there for a long period of time. You'll see those little portholes which have been drilled into those concrete cubes. Uh, which allow you to see out. And again, it just reduces the amount of dose received to the total body uh, while you're conducting certain activities. Another thing that they did to address the gamma field is they started constructing these concrete walls around the sarcophagus. And uh, then you see they put these concrete viewing boxes inside of there. And they do reduce the dose some. I would say probably a 20 to 30 percent reduction in dose. They're not as effective as the lead, obviously, uh, but they are doing what they can in this area, recognizing that you're never going to be able to fully mitigate the risks of working in a highly contaminated area like this, but they are trying to reduce the doses as they are able. And the entrances and exits to all the building, you have to pass through these radiation portals. Uh, where you can see us standing here. You have to put your hands and feet uh, and body in the correct positioning to make sure that you don't have any loose or fixed contamination that you're taking with you off-site. But uh, there is a significant problem of contamination in the environment. This is the cooling pond, an aerial satellite view of the cooling pond of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant uh, in the inset. In the main picture, you see the Kiev Reservoir. The city of Kiev is down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but you can see the cooling pond in the top of the image. Uh, it's, it's visible from space, obviously. Uh, this is a pumping station. The cooling pond is a man-made cooling station. And they used to uh, get water from the Pripyat River and pump it into the cooling ponds. And this is one of the pumping stations that they did that at. As we explored this local area, uh, this is still on site. We were looking for fuel fleas or small pieces of uh, the nuclear fuel that had been ejected from the reactor building. And when we did, we actually were able to find a hot spot of uh, cesium contamination, also with some americium. And uh, this is just sitting out in the environment. Uh, it's got uh, 3.7 microcuries, uh, sorry, nanocuries of just americium-241 in it. Uh, this is a pretty uh, 
standard sample for what you would see in, in different areas of the site. It's a little bit higher than some samples that you would see off-site. Uh, the gamma counts, it was over, over two and a half million gamma counts per minute just coming from this one hot spot. To kind of put that in contrast, there are many areas in the exclusion zone which do feature radiation levels, which the dose rate is not much higher than dose rates you would see here in the United States. This is Chernobyl City. This is the docks of Chernobyl City. It's about 20 miles away from the nuclear power plant. And the dose rates here were uh, comparable to dose rates that you would see in high elevation areas or maybe around a nuclear facility. Uh, they were maybe two times what we would consider normal background, but for that area, they were relatively low. And you might think that because the dose rates are low, it's also probably pretty difficult to find the environmental contamination. So we analyzed a small sample from right over here in uh, Chernobyl City where the dose rates were low. And you can see on the spectra these peaks. Each of these peaks are going to be a different radioactive material that we've identified a gamma emitting radioactive material. The two noticeable ones are americium and cesium. Uh, so even though the dose rate itself might not be something that would prevent somebody from moving back into this area. The spread of radioactive materials throughout the environment, the uptake into the plants and the local life, uh, this is something to still consider. So uh, this is an important fact to consider because, like I said, everyone wants to focus or concentrate on high dose rate areas. But even in the areas where the dose rates are not so significant, you can still easily find uh, the residual contamination that's been left behind by the accident. So I want to talk for a little bit. I want to leave as much time as possible uh, for questions and answers at the end, but I would like to talk about Chernobyl into the future and what they're going to have to do. Obviously, we discussed the new confinement structure that they're going to be moving in place. Uh, they hope to move that structure in place by 2017. I, I would probably be surprised if they moved it in place before 2018. That's probably my better guess. The spring or I'm sorry, the summer or fall of 2018, I could I could see them moving the sarcophagus, the new confinement structure in place. The sarcophagus will need to be dismantled. As the sarcophagus ages, it changes and it becomes more hazardous over time. As one worker put it. The sarcophagus used to be a symbol of accomplishment, but swiftly became a source of concern and controversy. But it's not just the melted nuclear fuel in the Unit 4 reactor. There were three other operating reactors on site. They all generated their own spent fuel. This is something that's going to have to be addressed. Uh, what you're looking at here is the ISF-1 building, the interim spent fuel number one building. And this is where they first unloaded the fuel from the spent uh, the uh, spent fuel ponds in the reactor buildings, and they collected them in this one structure. Every time we drove past this structure, the dose rates and our dosimeters would go up as we got no, uh, closer to it, and then drove past it. Uh, but this is again a temporary method of storage. It's a wet storage, and so what they are in the middle of doing is right now is they're constructing this facility. This is the ISF. Two facility. So this is the uh, next stage for the interim spent fuel processing and storage. In the concrete building on the left, they're going to take each assembly and they are going to process it and begin loading them into dry casks. Then they will be uh, hauled by this large garret, the yellow garret on the right, over into this uh, pad that they have created, a concrete pad where each uh, dry cask will be loaded horizontally into its own specific place. And this is where they plan to store the spent fuel uh, for the next 100 or 200 years. So the spent fuel management is going to be an important fact of what they have to do. That is where a lot of the residual risk would normally lie at an, at an operating reactor that did not have a severe accident. But just because there was a, a severe accident at Unit 4 that spread radioactive materials into the environment doesn't mean that they don't still have to properly manage the spent fuel that was generated from units one, two, and three. There, this is uh, examples of the fresh fuel. This is unfi unused nuclear fuel bundles that would have been stored on the wall 
inside of the Unit 4 reactor building. So it's not just the melted nuclear fuel from the reactor. It's not just the unused fuel inside of the Unit 4 reactor building, but they also have never recovered the spent fuel from the spent fuel pool in the Unit 4 building as well. And this is just some more examples of some of the fuel that you can find littering the ground inside of the sarcophagus. I think one of the important takeaways that I learned from this is that there are, it's going to be a problem with the long-term management of waste at the site. Um, every process that they take, whether it is even just laundering the clothes, when the workers come each, site, each day, they wear their personal clothes to the site. They go to their changing rooms where they dress into the uniforms that they wear while they're working on site. 3,500 workers a day, that's a lot of laundry. Even just doing the laundry uh, generates extra radioactive materials that have to be dealt with in the long term. Chernobyl is going to be the site of a long-term or permanent nuclear waste repository. They're not going to move these materials off-site to another area. This land has already been condemned. So they will build a repository where they will someday attempt to put all of the melted nuclear fuel, fuel from Unit 4, the spent fuel from Units 1, 2, and 3, as well as the radioactive uh, products that they are generating just from day-to-day -day operations. And this is something that I suspect will happen at Fukushima as well. Obviously, the location in Japan is going to be much more difficult because of its proximity to the ocean, but they are not going to be hauling these materials off-site through the, through the country uh, to a different long-term repository. I think that's an important takeaway uh, for, for people in Japan as well as for here in the United States, is that any site which has been cited for a reactor, a nuclear reactor, could potentially also become a long-term or permanent nuclear waste repository should that reactor in, enter an accident configuration and radioactive materials be released in volume. I'd like to talk a little bit before uh, we're winding down. I would like to talk about the workers of Chernobyl. Uh, we, ha we had the wonderful opportunity to spend time with them both on-site and off-site. When we were at the plant, we lived in Slovudic, the worker town. We took the train in with them every morning and the train back every afternoon. And I really generated a tremendous respect for the men and women who work at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This is the central square of the city of Slovudic, where they live. And uh, it was constructed, finished by 1987. Uh, and the workers now live here in the different blocks, which were all constructed by different countries in the former Soviet Union. This is the Semikoti train stop in the city of Slavutich, where the train comes up out of the fog in the mornings, and it parks at this station. All of the workers jump on, and the final destination, the end of the line, is the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Um, when we were on the trains, it's not uncommon to see workers uh, sleeping. It's about a 40, 45 minute train ride from Slavutich to the nuclear power plant. And on, on the first day, I remember kind of being curious about how you could sleep knowing that when you wake up, you're going to be at a place like Chernobyl. But by the third or fourth day, we were so exhausted from all of our activities that we as well were, were sleeping on this train ride. It's a, you know, it's a nice opportunity. Uh, but as you approach the power plant, you can see out the window, you can begin to see the structures coming into view. Uh, the, the train arrives here on site. This is the Semikoti uh, train station at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The workers exit off the train. They walk up this corridor and into their changing rooms where they change into their work clothes. And then they begin to enter the site. This is the sanatorium building which is where the workers would head next, those workers that work in the high radiation areas. And this is where you uh, put on additional layers or other protective materials depending on where you are going. As you walk out of the sanatorium and as you put on your, your protective gear, one of the first structures that you walk past is the new confinement structure. And then you begin to enter the construction zone of the site. And this is the turbine building 
Uh, if you turn to the left, you would see this. This is the new confinement structure. So there's not a lot of space. There's probably about five, 500 yards between the confinement structure that we see here and the sarcophagus and turbine building. They're in very close proximity to each other. And the, oper uh, the operations that the workers carry out on a day-to-day -day basis could vary. Uh, some of them obviously work on the construction. They could be going up in lifts or cranes and being lifted to do uh, operations on the top of the new confinement structure. This is a dosimetrist who is monitoring piles of debris that they are taking out of the construction zone. He will jump onto the back of this uh, truck and he will begin monitoring, making sure that they don't have anything that's more contaminated than they expect it to be. But the workers at Chernobyl today are not the same workers that were there when the accident happened. It's a generational problem. As you can see, this gentleman on the left, he can't be much older than 24, 25 at most. Most of the workers that work there today are the sons or daughters or cousins or nephews and nieces of the people that worked there in the 80s. In fact, uh, for the locals, it's much easier to get a job at the nuclear power plant if you had a family member or knew someone on the inside that could help get you a job. But this is also difficult in terms of retention and uh, your understanding of these complex radiation areas around the site. Uh, the people that know the site best have long since stopped working at the nuclear power plant. And so now you're a few generations of workers removed from that. And obviously, keeping them trained about the potential things that they might come into contact with or uh, even their finding their way around the interior corridors of the plant uh, is a big, it's a big problem. And that's something that they saw at Fukushima as well. Uh, at Fukushima, it's really one of the first times that it became so clearly apparent how valuable these day-to-day -day staff are. Nuclear power plants, you know, uh, are are not new structures. They're 40, 60 years old. And during that course of 40 to 60 years, they have installed all types of new systems, new updates, new electric, new pipes. And so the original blueprints often aren't as accurate as they should be. And when you have a severe accident and you have critical radiation levels, time, distance, and shielding are all important to managing worker doses. And so the people that work there on a day-to-day -day basis obviously have the best working knowledge of the interiors of these buildings and how to get around quickly to one place. Or if, you have, you're, if one path to this location you want to get is blocked, are there ulterior paths that they can get? So this is one of the issues that's raised by these long-term accidents, you know, like, like Chernobyl where you have 30 years and the workers that are working here today don't have as intimate a knowledge or uh, understanding of the on-site conditions as those workers in the early days. After we exited the Unit 4 control room, we were standing outside of the sanatorium building with all of the other workers who were uh, on break at the time. And we were taking pictures. And uh, I saw this one gentleman. I saw this gentleman right here uh, who was, had what I would call an American or a Western smile. And um, uh, it was very difficult to get a picture of him. Uh, he would not quite look at me as I wanted him to. Uh, we were milling around, and, and his buddies that he was talking to kind of saw what I was doing. And they saw I was trying to get a picture of him, but he wasn't cooperating. And one of them reached out, grabbed his face, and turned it towards me. Uh, and, and I grabbed this picture, which is probably my favorite picture of the trip, but this was kind of uh, emblematic of our relationships with the workers. You know, we're standing outside in their comfort zone, we're taking pictures, we didn't really know how they would react to this, but the workers were uh, very, very considerate and kind of us, and I, I can't thank them enough for how they treated us while we were there, and I can't tell you how much I respect them for going to Chernobyl every day and doing the work that they do. Uh, this is my friend Anton, who is our primary liaison at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This is the gentleman that would take us around and show us. And when I think of Chernobyl, I don't think of the sarcophagus anymore. That's not the first thought on my mind. The first thought on my mind are workers and people like Anton. And on my last day at the site, I was sitting across at lunch at the cafeteria from Anton, and we were talking. And, and I was asking him, you know, what can I do? that's going to have a meaningful impact for the workers. 
And I was thinking of things that I could do in Ukraine. But Anton reached across the table and he grabbed my hands and he just looked at me and he said, Lucas, the best thing that you can do is you can go out and tell the truth. You can tell the good and the bad, but that's the best that you can do for us. And that's what I have tried to do here. So I would like, we've, we've gone a little bit over on time, but I think we still have some time for questions and answers and I will turn it over to that portion of the meeting now. Great. Well, thank you, Lucas, for this really detailed and, and compelling view of, of what's, you know, of the history of Chernobyl and, and the present and the future. Um, we'll go ahead and start the Q&A session now. Uh, we've got, I think, some questions queued up. Um, and let me just explain for all those who might have missed it at the beginning or to refresh your memory. Uh, you can ask a question one of two ways. Uh, using the, uh, the control panel that should be in the right-hand portion of your screen, uh, to ask a question verbally, uh, press the yellow hand icon, uh, which will raise your hand, and we'll go through those questions um, in as close as to the order that they're that they're that they're posed as possible. Uh, if you want to submit a written question, uh, you can use that using the uh, the questions panel in the, in that control panel on the right hand part of your screen, and we'll be interspersing written questions and verbal questions as we go through it. Um, so, you know, with some sensitivity to time, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started um, with our with our questions. Uh, we'll go first to uh, Carolyn Treadway. Uh, Carolyn, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you. Um, my question is about the length of time that these places will be um, uninhabitable, lethal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I hear of talk of thousands of years, but uh, the half-life of plutonium is 10,000 U.S. Um, Amer um, human generation. So I don't understand why people are not saying, why people can be saying thousands of years when it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. I guess I would have to say that's just not a very well considered problem. Um, I think that for all intents and purposes this land will be condemned as, as for as long as, as we're here. Uh, it, it'll be condemned for longer than all of recorded history, and I'm not willing to bet, you know, much farther than that. So, uh, yes, you know, for the next 5,000 years, it, it'll be uninhabitable in certain areas of the zone. Uh, but as you mentioned, the half-lives of many of these materials are much longer than that. Uh, at some point, you just kind of have to condemn the land rather than even try and guess when it will return to some type of uh, useful use. And uh, I think that that's something that we are running into with these severe accidents. Obviously, uh, governments or regulatory officials, they don't, they don't like focusing on some of the odious facts that come out of these accidents. But I think that you're very right in pointing out that uh, for all intents and purposes, this land will be condemned and unuseful uh, for as long as people are working in that area. Okay, next we have a question from Scott Porchline. Uh, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay, I'd like your impression since you were there. Uh, my impression is everything about this from uh, the first cleanup attempts uh, right after the accident seems so archaic, including uh, now the cascading walls that they had built and the techniques that they're using now uh, where they're not using fiber optic uh, lenses so that they uh, they can observe you know they wouldn't have to stand behind these lead walls with uh, port holes built into them and why aren't they using drones for observation purposes that sort of thing so is it as archaic as it seems to me well I think we can kind of break this up into three different periods so the period right after the accident and that's generally where I like to start I think we focus too much on the accident itself and maybe the 30 seconds or 30 minutes before the accident and we don't focus enough on the lasting impact. So the immediate emergency operations at the time of the explosions were literally just to try and con contain as much of this material away from the critical areas that the workers had to go. They weren't focused on cleaning up the site. They weren't focused on cleaning up the environment. They were focused on getting workers into critical areas to conduct uh, certain activities, and so they had to clear paths, or they, you know, you had fuel and graphite littered across the site. So in those early days, it was really just pump and dump. You would push the materials into piles if you came across a really, really uh, 
a hot piece of fuel or graphite or if a piece of equipment became heavily contaminated, you would dig a hole and you would bury it. Uh, I was talking earlier with him about a story. Uh, one of the gentlemen that we met on site, his name is Dima, uh, and he's in charge of certain operations around the sarcophagus in relation to the construction of the new confinement structure. And he told us about a, a year ago, you know, he's sitting at home at about 6 o'clock in the morning, he gets a phone call. They had been digging out the trenches which will traverse the new confinement structure over the sarcophagus, and they were using a front-end loader, and they pulled up these pipes out of the ground, and these pipes were uh, setting off the radiation alarms, and by the time that DEMA got on site and figured out what these materials were, it was actually fuel assemblies, and the, with, complete with zirconium that had been launched outside of the uh, reactor building, had landed in the local zone, and uh, you know, part of the emergency efforts were just burying them. Uh, in the intermittent period, uh, you know, they've obviously gotten away from burying it. That's not a very responsible way. It's really an emergency uh, knee-jerk response. Uh, they, they did try to sort and classify and containerize certain materials. I didn't get to include those slides as much as I would like to uh, due to time constraints. But today, you know, I don't... Observation systems, yes. Drones... I don't know that there's a, a huge part for them to do. Even with a drone, you know, you have to kind of be savvy at interpreting the images that come back. And most of these workers, you know, they're general construction workers. Uh, and, and for them, getting hands-on and going and looking at it physically is going to be the quickest method uh, to get an answer back for them. So yes, some of these uh, methodologies may seem rudimentary. But I think, in a sense, they're also kind of necessary in, in certain aspects because you get a more complete picture. Uh, and the, the, the radiation levels around the reactor building, they're inescapable. They're an unavoidable fact of being in close proximity to the structure itself. And so the best that they can do is use the three uh, rules of radio protection, time, distance, and shielding, to their advantage. Great. So I think we'll go to some uh, some written questions. We have several of them so far. Um, so there's a couple here from uh, from Adrian Zolkover. Uh, the first is uh, maybe we can just you know ask both of them and then we can go through them. Um, isn't the multiple meltdowns at Fukushima much worse than Chernobyl as far as release and spread of radiation in any other ways you know of? And the second question is uh, on that chart of cesium-137 radiation. Isn't that spike indicative of the level of contamination a person, or isn't that spike indicative of the level of contamination a person living in that area would be exposed to? And wouldn't that increase the level of radioactivity absorbed by people there? Or are they considering a blend effect, uh, like a certain amount of asbestos in the building spaces? However, if, however, if you are sitting near an air conditioner vent, you may get hundreds of times that average. Um, okay. Uh, start with the multiple meltdowns. Uh, in terms of an operating safety standpoint, yeah, way worse. Uh, you know, you had three reactors that went down at Japan. Uh, then you had the unexpected explosion of the Unit 4 reactor building and the spent fuel concerns that were related to that building as well. In terms of the off-site release, I would say that it's probably not well enough understood at this point. The, you know, the main difference that you will have between these two is that when Chernobyl blew up, the reactor itself blew up, the fuel, the moderator was spread throughout the site. It was uh, reduced to extremely small particle sizes. The gases were allowed 100% release. Uh, so I think in terms of the off-site risk to the immediate population, maybe Chernobyl had a greater impact to people that lived in the local area within 20 to 30 miles. But in terms of, you know, the long-term release at Fukushima, obviously that has brought it to the forefront of our concerns. Uh, and there, you know, there is no hope of containing that release uh, at Fukushima in the near future. At Chernobyl, they had the sarcophagus built within six months, and that knocked down a lot of the particulate release. The sarcophagus does nothing to address the gases that are released. Um, but they were at least able to mitigate some of the particulate release. And at, at Fukushima, you've seen them try to do the same with these tents that they're constructing around the reactors. And, um, but I guess I would have to say, at, at the base, I don't think we know enough about the, either release 
to really be able to say which one is going to have the greatest off-site impact. I mean, in terms of uh, inventory, obviously Fukushima had the greater potential with three cores, but in terms of the actual delivery and transport, Chernobyl allowed larger pieces of fuel and moderator out into the environment, and they were spread by these explosions and fires. Um, so I think they're both very serious, but also uh, somewhat different. Uh, the second question about the cesium-137 and the spectra. Yes, this is an example of what people would be living in. And that was kind of the point that I wanted to make with that image, is that even if the dose rates, what my dosimeter tells me, I'm being exposed to just from walking through these areas might be relatively similar to something I might see outside of the zone. That image was specifically put in there to help you understand that there is, it does not mean that the local area is not contaminated or not affected by the materials that have been released. And yes, that is what people would be coming into contact with if they're burning brush or if they're growing food or if they're trying to uh, all of your activities really put you in, in proximity to different radioactive materials. Great. Uh, so the next question is from Michelle Lee. Uh, Michelle asks, uh, when I was in the Soviet Union four years after Chernobyl, I kept hearing from people, quote, everyone is sick, all the children are sick. Did you have the opportunity to talk to health workers during your trip? Uh, our focus was actually on the plant and on the plant site itself. Uh, we spent our days, we only spent one, I'm sorry, two days off-site in the zone. And I mean, that was pretty much constricted to a day in Pripyat uh, and a day in the zone visiting other sites like Chernobyl City. Most of our focus was on the actual site. Uh, the majority of our time was spent on-site. But that gave us a different opportunity to talk with the workers. And again, this is uh, generational workers. So, uh, for example, Anton, my friend there, uh, his mother worked for the uh, Soviet League, uh, the Communist League in Pripyat. She was in charge of evacuating certain districts in the city. His father became a security guard at the power plant. And we heard many troubling stories about the lingering health effects on workers. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to talk to a lot of the health officials on the greater public health at large. Okay, uh, next question is from Alfred Meyer. You discussed how in the administration building, turning away from the line of sight of the sarcophagus, in effect, you used your body as a shield, which in turn lowered the measure of radiation. Does that mean your body absorbed the difference between the higher and lower readings? Yes. Uh, it's essentially just a uh, method of demonstrating the effectiveness of the body as a meat shield. It was about a 50% in dose reduction. Uh, you know, the body is mostly watered. It's a relatively good uh, shielding tool that you can use. Uh, it's about as effective as those lead walls. But then, yes, you are correct. The, my back, my neck, the back of my skull was in turn taking the dose um, that I could have avoided by walking to the other side of the room. Uh, next question is from Vic Max. Uh, how long will gamma, alpha, beta radiation remain above previous background radiation? I am informed that this can be up to a million years, depending on the radionuclide in question, uh, recognizing half-lives of radionuclides. For as long as people are living in that area, there is no efforts currently underway to clean up the contamination in the zone. They haven't even really begun to address the contamination around the site. You know, we talked about them uh, putting in the tracks for this new confinement structure and pulling out pieces of fuel assemblies and zirconium. So if they haven't cleaned that up, they absolutely haven't gone off-site. And uh, one engineer at Chernobyl told us, you know, the accident will not be over until every released atom has been returned to Chernobyl. And if that's your, your definition, then the accident will never be over because they will never achieve that level of cleanup in the zone. So for all intents and purposes, yes, uh, as long as uh, people are living in that area, uh, depending on where they are or where they go, they will be able to find residual traces of this accident uh, for as long as I can guess. Um, next question is from uh, Don Diekman. Uh, it says, an hour is too little time for this much information. Is there a documentary movie or a series of movies that we can use to make sure there will be no more nuclear power plants? Or is anyone planning to do one? And I guess maybe another related question would be, is there, uh, you know, some sort of 
uh, you know, film version of uh, information that, that kind of encapsulates a lot of, you know, the facts of the, of the incident. I agree. Uh, you know, there were so many more things that I wanted to talk about or go into more detail about, and it was kind of rushed, so I do apologize for that. You know, to be honest, there is no real easy answer to that question. There are a lot of good reading materials out there. The video material um, is, is, is not really as focused as I would like it to be in terms of presenting the on-site story, uh, and that's partially probably due to restriction put in place by the power plant. You know, you are restricted by your ability to access those areas, and they won't provide the access necessarily to members of the media. Uh, the reason why we were provided access was because of our industry affiliation. Uh, the members of this trip that went were all people that worked for uh, the government or worked for the military or worked at universities or for national labs, uh, emergency responders. In fact, I was one of the few people from the private industry uh, that was there. And um, so we were allowed much greater access than most people just because of our knowledge and familiarity with these types of environments. And it was actually a vocational uh, training period. I have a wonderful certificate from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant uh, after, this, after this trip. So uh, I guess in short, I wish there were some better video materials. In my estimate, there's really not. There's some good books, but most of them are focused on 1988 and before. There has not been much released in the interim to talk about the long-term impacts. Great. Um, then we have another question from Alfred Meyer. Uh, is it known if radiation at the Chernobyl site is contaminating the groundwater, the, the groundwater in the Pripyat River? How does this affect the water supply for Kiev? They do monitor the uh, migration of radioactive materials through the Pripyat River. Uh, yes, there is a problem with the groundwater contamination. Uh, you know, there's also a problem with just the cooling pond. You know, this man-made cooling pond that they've put in place there, uh, they directly introduced radioactive materials into it. They were pumping water out of the basement of the Unit 4 reactor building directly into the cooling pond. Uh, and then there were a few other uh, times where they would bulldoze material into it. So the cooling pond now the silt at the bottom of the cooling pond is incredibly contaminated with uh, long-lived isotopes, cesium, strontium, plutonium. Uh, and because the power plant is not in operation anymore, they don't necessarily need the cooling ponds. You know, they don't have to cool down any reactors. But they can't just uh, stop managing them because if they stop managing them, it's man-made. It would, uh, you know, most of the water would leave. It would evaporate or, or go into the ground at some point. And uh, you would leave about 85% of the cooling pond silt exposed for aerial deposition, for wind deposition, uh, for people to walk across, for vegetation to grow. Uh, so there are some long-term problems in place with the contamination of groundwater, the cooling ponds. The Pripyat River, they, they, they monitor more than other areas. But as a person who works in this field, again, you know, my job is to go out into these contaminated areas and to find uh, how these materials are moving through the environment, whether it's a site that hasn't been cleaned up yet or a site that has been cleaned up yet. Uh, I'll, I'll say two things. Number one, your success rate is largely going to depend on your interest in finding the contamination. If you don't want to find it, you cannot find it. If you want to find it and you're willing to put in the work, uh, it you, you, you can better understand it. But also, in terms of the long-term cleanup, there is no easy answer to remediate some of these areas. And so the best that we can do is try to monitor and try to stop the obvious pathways, but you're never going to be 100% uh, effective. Yeah, so, um, well, I think this is uh, Carolyn Trebway again. Carolyn, I think you also submitted a written question, but I'll go ahead and unmute you in case you want to ask it verbally. Okay, thank you very much. I, yes, I uh, did the same in written. You said um, that officials don't want to really say how long it can be um, uninhabitable in a place. And I've been to the Fukushima disaster area twice, and I know that people are thinking, well, they can move home in 40 years or something like that. And to me, that's criminal because they can't and be safe. And wouldn't it help banishing nuclear power forever 
to really have the truth be told about the fact that these sites will be uninhabitable forever. You know, I, I agree you're right. I think that is one of the catalyst type of facts that really has a large impact um, because especially with this field, it is easy to get distracted by the science and miss the implications. And so, you know, when you start talking about dose rates or miller rankins to micro sieverts, you know, it's easy to get lost in the pea soup and to miss on the big impacts that will happen. Uh, there's a lot of forward-looking marketing statements that are made about nuclear power from conception to operation to decommissioning. Uh, things are continually not fully analyzed. Uh, problems are not fully considered until they actually happen. And regardless, you know, the, you, you will always hear new marketing statements. That's what I call marketing statements because they're not really grounded in any basis of reality. They're more to kind of get you to feel a certain way about something. And uh, I think you're right. For all intents and purposes, this land is condemned. It's uninhabitable, unuseful uh, for as long as we can imagine. And then we have another question from Vic Max. Uh, Chernobyl consequences of the catastrophe for people and the environment by Yablokov, Nestorenko, and Nestorenko uh, translated into the English by New York Academy of Sciences says much about human impacts and is available online. Yeah, uh, Professor Yablokov has a, has a wonderful book that's out there. Um, but even then, I think it focuses on only part of the impacts. I think the more that you learn and discover, the more that you're open to thinking about the impacts. I mean, even just the laundry. Something as simple as doing laundry generates enormous amounts of waste on an annual basis there. You know, they have different uh, sorting systems, so obviously not all of the laundry is as contaminated as some of it. It all goes through different processes. It all goes through different equipment. But then they can't just release the, you know, they don't even use water. They use chemical uh, solvents instead. But they have to store that. After they use it to process the laundry, they have to store that on site. So there's a lot of uh, increased risk that builds over time at something like this. So, uh, you know, even if I were to try and put everything that I knew into a book or into a movie, it would still only be a part of the picture. You really just have to become more familiar with it to understand how all of these operations on a day-to-day -day basis generate their own problems in terms of contamination and they'll have to be dealt with in the long term. Great. Well, I think that leads us uh, to the last of our of our questions. Um, and so, I think I, you know what I would like to do, you know, here at the end is, um, you know, kind of give Lucas an opportunity to to leave us with any parting thoughts or, or to any topics that, uh, that 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 you think weren't covered by this so far. Well, you know, we didn't get a great opportunity to talk about the control rooms or some of the critical areas in the sarcophagus, but it, you know, I think in terms of the global problem. Uh, that's probably on the on the less significant side of it. I think what's really become critically important to me is understanding the impact of these long-lasting disasters. The fact that we are 30 years after the explosions, and really the only thing that we've done on site at Chernobyl is we've covered a crippled reactor building with one structure. That structure is now unstable, heavily contaminated, and what's our answer? to build another structure over top of that one. And uh, we don't have good answers available for how to mitigate the consequences of severe accidents. And severe accidents are something that is going to happen during the operation of reactors. It, it is not a perfect technology. We are not perfect operators. And there are no perfect conditions. So I think that for people that for, uh, for us that live in the United States, we have to try and learn semantically. That way we're not forced to endure episodically. And I'll put this in this kind of perspective. It's kind of like teaching a child that the stove is hot. Sure, I can try and explain to the child the semantic difference between hot and cold, and you're going to touch this and you're going to get burned. But not every child can make that connection. Some of them have to reach out and touch the stove and burn themselves 
and have it episodically seared into their memory before they learn not to play with fire. And I really hope that that's not true for the United States. I really hope that we don't have to endure a severe accident on the level of Chernobyl and Fukushima before we really begin to weigh the risks of operation. And one way that we could begin to handle that risk is by thinking of the potential long-term impact. One of the, the easiest areas to highlight, and I called it out a little bit in the presentation, but one of the easiest areas to highlight is the fact that both Chernobyl and Fukushima is going to become long-term permanent repositories for nuclear waste. And neither of them was ever cited originally for that purpose. Fukushima would be one of the last places you would want a long-term permanent repository. It's a seismically active area. You've got the ocean. You've got tsunamis. That is a terrible place. But unfortunately, that's what it's going to become. Chernobyl, much the same story. It's a terrible place for a long-term repository. It's swampy ground. There's lots of water. Uh, there's uh, there, there used to be a heavy population in the area. This is not places where we would cite long-term permanent repositories. And I think if we were taking a more mature approach to operating reactors, we would consider that when we license them, when we relicense them, uh, when we operate them, is there is the potential that we could enter a configuration at any reactor where we have a severe accident. And so the question would be, are we prepared and are we understanding of the impacts of that? And you know, there's not a, an operating site here in the United States that would be considered a good or even kind of good site for a permanent waste repository. Uh, but if any one of them had this severe accident, that's exactly what they would turn into. It's kind of like what's happened at Hanford. You know, Hanford is not a great place for a long-term waste repository, but there is a bunch of waste above ground and underground there with no real plans, uh, concrete plans, to remove it. Um, I think that that's an important fact that we often gloss over with our infatuation with the accident sequence. But I would like for us more to focus on the long-term impacts, both the social impacts, the health impacts, the industrial impacts, the economic impacts, uh, and, and you know the ones we focused on today, the environmental impact. Well, that's great, Lucas. Thank you so much for for those concluding thoughts. It's a really sobering perspective on um, the problem that's before us, both you know with existing reactor sites and and uh, you know and sites like Chernobyl, where this kind of disaster has taken place. I want to thank everybody for. Uh, uh, for, for participating today and for joining the webinar, for your terrific questions um, and the insightful discussion that happened. Uh, and also, I want to encourage everyone to, to stay tuned for more events in our Nuclear's Dirty series uh, here from NEARS. Uh, you can find out more about it on our website if you're not uh, already on our email list uh, where announcements about future events are, are going to be going out. Uh, you can sign up for that at our website, uh, www.nirs.org. And also, if you want to continue to support this work and help us get the word out and, and, and spread uh, this information further, uh, please consider uh, giving a uh, contribution on our crowdfunding page. Uh, that's at nuclearisdirty.nears.org. And uh, for the time being, uh, all contributions to the fundraising camp, to the crowdfunding campaign, um, are going to be matched dollar for dollar. Uh, so you can really amplify the impact of, um, of your contribution that way as well. So thank you, everyone, and uh, and please stay tuned, and uh, and thank you for all of your work and all your support and all of your activism.